So this is going to be a whistle stop tour of the products that um, me and Max and a few other people have come up with called Clinical Metrics. Uh, and I'm really going to be framing it through like the lessons that we learned through this somewhat perilous and hard journey. Um, and hopefully you can learn from us and we can talk about it in the panel. OK, so I've already uh, been introduced, so I won't spend too much time on this. But basically, I'm a GP by background, trained in East London. Uh, I'm an epidemiologist. I've published a lot, mostly on COVID data. Um, I worked at Open Safely in Oxford uh, in our sort of high times of COVID. And now I mostly work on software, um, so work in Rust and uh, Python. And the reason I'm involved, well, one of the many reasons I'm involved with CyrilDB is uh, kindly sponsoring my PhD, which is in medical statistics. And I'm looking at synthetic data. And I can talk about that at length, as I'm sure many people who've done PhDs can. <laughs> Uh, and we also, Max and I, have written this uh, book, which is coming out a on async Rust, uh, an O'Reilly book. It's coming out, I think, in December, but it's, uh, it's uh, available for early release if you want to check it out. So I'm just going to start by what is the problem that I'm trying to solve with the Clinical Metrics product? So I worked uh, in medical education for quite a while. And um, who here is a doctor or has a clinician of any sort? Have you done simulation training with the models? Yeah. Okay, so the people who are not uh, sort of in clini clinical medicine, you'll have something like this model. It looks really fancy. Sometimes they talk, sometimes they breathe. Uh, generally speaking, they just try and die, and you have to try and revive them. And uh, they are gr they're good fun, and they have their purposes. But they're very expensive to run. They cost about £100,000. Uh, and basically you do one scenario maybe once a year if you're lucky okay so basically to write one-off case studies it's really expensive they're horrible to write they take ages there are other forms of simulation training which we can get into um, but the case-based approach is very it doesn't scale very well the other thing that used to annoy me so much when I was working in medical education is you'd be working on this model and you'd say it's just one patient but in real life you don't have just one patient at a time you have patients who come and go you've got to remember to go back and check them you've got to remember to like coordinate write some notes uh, so I wanted to solve this with the simulation program um, results are not available immediately in real life so if I have your blood so I take it uh, I don't have the results of what your heart levels are doing, uh, troponin levels are doing immediately. So you have to remember to come back to that. And that adds to the cognitive load of being a junior doctor or any doctor, actually. Uh, and as I said, it's kind of all competes together. You've got lots of uh, managing priorities. And that's a key part of the job. Uh, and for me, it was the most difficult part of being a junior doctor was like remembering who have I seen? Who do I need to go back and check? Who do I need to write discharge notes for? Uh, meanwhile, you're trying to triage them. So it's a complex job. And this sort of traditional simulation scales terribly and doesn't solve for the majority of these problems. So um, that's why I wanted to have a new approach. And so we got together and we thought about a solution. So uh, really, I was an epidemiologist at the time. Um, I wanted to not write case studies. I wanted the data to generate the case studies in a machine, like basically the machine to do the hard work for you. So that's what the approach we've taken. We generate the data from the underlying disease characteristics. Patients, they don't come one at a time. Uh, results are not available immediately. So that's something I wanted to build in. And um, we wanted to manage competing priorities. So this is the product. So it's clinical metrics um, and it is uh, available in mostly in Germany at the moment under the name of Davina, but we're hoping to move into the UK market later this year. Uh, and I am going to be doing a demo, so bear with me. It's always when you do a live demo, things might go wrong. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to talk about some of the approaches. So um, based on kind of what we wanted, we decided to go for a browser based solution. So. I've already kind of slammed on traditional simulation training. Now it's VR's turn. Okay, VR, everyone loves VR. They think it's great, but it's actually a big problem because the headsets are very expensive. They break, they get lost, they get stolen, and uh, they go out of date very, very quickly. And I know of 
quite a few medical schools who have spent, I mean, to the tune of hundreds of thousands of pounds on VR headsets, which they've basically not used. So, um, yeah, VR is not a good solution. And if you look at some of the research around VR, um, it does two things. It increases confidence and decreases competence. So pretty much the worst combination that you can have, especially when you're talking about training doctors. So the other approach we wanted to take was a chatbot. So instead of these questions, you just take a history. We wanted you to have that organic experience of taking a history. Now, bear in mind, we started in 2020 and the chatbot, actually, I had an earlier version of it. So this is prior to ChatGPT. So I can talk about maybe in the questions we can talk about ChatGPT uh, and how it's affected us. Uh, but yeah, we have a chatbot. Uh, we've simulated time with a turn-based game. Uh, that's you have to wait so many turns for your your basically it's a you know time to progress, and you can order any test for any patient. So this is the demo. Uh, oh, I'm speaking to this. I don't need to. Um, so I've already skipped some steps just in the interest of time. So this is an A and E uh, board of patients that come in. So you you start with three patients. And you'll see turns up on the right hand side. And essentially, you just have to manage the workflow of your patients. And what we do is we have whole classes log in at the same time, like 150 people, and they'll all do the same sorts of diseases, but not the same patients, because all the patients are completely unique to that person. So uh, you never get this problem where you might remember the case study, they're all unique. So if I just pick one, maybe if I do this one, it's a bit big, uh, but this is an AI generated uh, patient. I'll make it slightly smaller. You've got OBS charts, so you can take OBS that are realistic to the disease. We've got a chat, uh, just do it here. So you can take a history, so uh, hello, hi. How are you? Not feeling great. You know, do you have chest pain? That sort of thing. And you can ask it lots of things like, do you smoke? And these are all tied to the underlying disease. So we think about patients in terms of diseases rather than individual case studies. And that allows us to generate huge amounts of patients. And we have on the order of like, I think 20,000 unique patients have been paid, 2,000 users. Um, so that's the chat bot. You can take, do examinations. So say you might want to do a respiratory examination and you get some results. That's translation from Germany. But Okay. And then we can write notes here. Okay. This is a note. And as you, uh, as you go through this, you can see that we're putting data in. So this data is not just in and then lost forever. We can then give this back to the teachers and give this back to researchers to find out what are your students actually doing when they're faced with a patient who's got a chest infection, say. Um, we can then order blood tests. So lots of blood tests. You can order literally any blood test, even if it's wildly inappropriate. Um, you've got investigations again the same thing uh, let me do an ECG actually and you have to put in priority so I'll just put something random in here okay uh, we've got treatment so you can order lots of drugs again including things which are wildly inappropriate you can give IV adrenaline Steph I can see you laughing at the back <laughs> Um, so uh, Steph is a pharmacist by background, so I'm sure has corrected the likes of my drug charts when I was uh, a junior doctor. Um, we've got specialty consultations, so you can essentially phone a friend, ask a cardiologist or someone. Uh, you can look at your documentation and uh, add additional documentation, add diagnoses and uh, check out guidelines. So it's pretty comprehensive. And as we've gone through that, I'm, if you notice, we've got 24 turns up here. If I just uh, go on a bit more and then we go back to this, we've got a new patient who's arrived. So we started with three and we now have four. So you've got to keep on track of it. You're not going to necessarily always be told when a patient has arrived. OK, so that's the, the technical solution that we've gone for. 
And uh, one final thing I just wanted to show um, is we have ECGs now, which is very exciting. So they're a new addition and we're getting x-rays and images uh, of other things like fractures and stuff um, shortly. Okay, so this next bit is not going to be a super sexy part of our journey. Okay, so the chatbot's great. People love the chatbot, okay? However, it is it has its own problems because what happens with our particular scenarios, we have like 150 people all try and log in within like a five minute window to a class. And um, we thought that's going to be great. This is when we started in 2020. And uh, this is what happened to our servers. The green is the chatbot server. This is, and uh, you can see it basically uh, got hit pretty hard. And uh, yes, it was quite a challenge. So luckily, we did luck out in one thing. I'm not going to say it was intentional because it wasn't. We had actually got really interested in metrics and like, what's going on in the cluster? And so this is how we knew where the problem was because like the user part of it, it just stopped working uh, in a class. It was very stressful. Um, and so we luckily, we had built in metrics. So we were able to log in and immediately be like, OK, the chatbot is the problem here and then work out from there. So we went overboard maybe on uh, the metrics. So there's lots of things. If you're starting a med tech uh, solution or any technical solution, we're using uh, Grafana here. Oh, this one is Grafana, which I recommend. It's a free solution. Uh, we also are using FreshPing, a free solution. It tells you whether your website is up. And we're using Century, which we do pay for, but it's very cheap and definitely worth it because it tells you kind of what's going on in all of your different servers. So that was like lesson one. Um, cool. So focusing again on the chat book because it's a good example of some of the lessons learnt. So we thought, what can we do? Okay, so the first thing we did was we trained the patients overnight and cached them. So that was a good kind of quick and dirty solution. Uh, we also set about auto-scaling the servers. And again, this is something that... Um, Basically, we had an amazing DevOps engineer called Harry, who I would recommend to anyone. He's become a dear friend to us. He, we invested in uh, getting some proper infrastructure because it's just me and Max doing most of the programming. Um, and he advised us to go for an infrastructure as code solution. So rather than if you like log into AWS or a Google Cloud Platform or an AWS, uh, there's lots of buttons. They like to move the buttons around sometimes. If you use infrastructure as code, it's uh, your ears just code, right? You don't have to think, oh, like, is it on this button? Do I need to go into a sub menu? So it's a good solution. The second, well, the third lesson we had was ultimately the chatbot needed to be rewritten. And we were using Python. That's what we were most familiar with at the time. Uh, but we decided to switch to Rust. And uh, sometimes you've just got to, like if there's a slow part of your system, you've just got to switch to a different language. Uh, unfortunately, that's just part of it. And uh, one thing that I just wanted to really mention on the next page is essentially unit testing completely saved us here. Just with the two of us, because we kept the API exactly the same between Python and Rust, it meant that we could switch it out and we knew it wasn't going to break anything else in our uh, cluster. Uh, servers and so we had these very extensive uh, like pretty much 100% unit coverage and integration test coverage uh, and that was that enabled us to essentially switch one language out for another language and when we did it we didn't get any errors we actually thought we hadn't done it correctly but it just worked because we had tested it so that was the lesson here which is just like make testing easy and normal. It should be part of your core infrastructure, your core um, sort of like culture of your company right from the get go. We always tell ourselves we'll go back and test something. Generally speaking, we don't. So this is it. Uh, we then went mad with testing. So um, there is Jasprit and Amanda. Do you want to just wave your hands? So there are two lovely medical students who help us with the data that is a uh, like underlying all of the, the clinical metrics patients. And uh, back in the day, prior to you guys arriving, we had other people working on the project and the data has to be structured in a really like particular way to be ingested and to create patients. 
Uh, and it was driving me crazy because people kept putting extra spaces in and maybe just like a comma somewhere, you know, all of the stuff that we do. So what we, me and Max spent basically a week or two weeks writing tests to test the data entry. And so uh, that allows basically the people who are working on our, our product. And we have a large team now of um mostly in Germany we have lots of people entering data in German and I don't speak German but it passes all of the tests and then I can be assured that it works so setting up tests for non-coders is really essential uh, and I would recommend everyone does it cool so uh, the other thing that we found this is the final kind of point is uh, we started with a very fixed idea of what our data was going to look like and it turns out to not be correct Okay, so we went with a Postgres solution. Um, if we had, were going to do this again, we would have gone for something like Surreal. Um, and I'd recommend that you would use Surreal in this situation because we want to be flexible with what data we want to pull out. At the time, we didn't really think necessarily about what would be useful for teachers or lecturers who were running these classes. That became a much bigger part of what the product ended up being. Um, and we had to do some like changing around of the database, dropping tables, and it got a bit messy at times. So I think if we were to go back, we would have used Surreal. Obviously, Surreal wasn't in existence four years ago when we started, but definitely um, you should be thinking about using that. Cool. So I pulled together all of the lessons and I've added one. So all of this was possible. Uh, the overriding thing is we had a microservices uh, structure and uh, that and then we've got the lessons underneath that so microservices allowed us to pull out um, servers change them into different languages and our tech stack looks quite different from when we started where are we now so we're fully embedded into the curriculum in two universities in germany we've integrated with a single sign-on uh, they're very sophisticated in germany they have a single sign-on for all medical students in the whole country if you can believe such a thing and uh, we won the best teaching tool in 2022. Uh, we're hoping to move into the UK market later this year. And basically, what we're quite pleased with what we've achieved. We've got good cash flow uh, with sort of no VCs. And it's mostly just me and Max still with some contractors. We've got 52 diseases uh, and it's expanding. What our tech stack looks like now. So uh, wildly different to how we started. But we now have Rust Nano Services, um, and Nano Services is something that Max uh, has basically come up with, which is a way of developing your code as a nan as a small microservice or Nano Service with lots of tests in isolation. You test basically, you test it, and it has its own CI, and then you compile it into a single binary, and you just deploy that single binary. Uh, we still love Python, but we've sort of switched to really using Python more as like fancy bash. So we use it for testing, for doing like moving stuff around, uh, some deployment. Um, and uh, yeah, we've moved to using also atomic testing. So uh, kind of very pure Python in that regard. Our front end is now TypeScript uh, and it's bundled into a single binary. Uh, well, it's bundled in with ES build and then it's in the single binary. So it makes the whole thing quite small. Okay, so that was a quick tour. Our future plans is we're moving into UK market this year. I'm going full time for the first time in four years, which is really exciting. <laughs> um, and we've got, a, we've got a new contract to do some orthopedics and trauma, which we're really excited about and adding some mass casualty events. Uh, and yeah, hopefully uh, you'll be seeing a lot more of us. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. So the basic question, unit testing for sort of chatbots and machine learning, that's mm -hmm. quite interesting, especially since you got 100%. Machine learning isn't meant to be predictable. How have you done that? Yes, yeah, so we're not really using like machine learning per se. It's uh, using sentence embeddings. So um, t now I can talk about like what it's probably going to become. Uh, and so testing might fall over when we move to using more of like an LMM solution. But certainly with sentence embeddings, you can get pretty good coverage. Uh, so that's kind of this, that's the approach. Yeah. Yeah, well. Hi, right, we'll go. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Very nicely done, by the way. Okay. My question was that in terms of predictions, let's say, for example, as you just saw, so I showed us, 
the uh, especially AI as such patients. Mm-hmm. Created, okay. I was wondering, let's say, for example, if you wanted to uh, really challenge your students and say, okay, you might have a, a patient come in mm-hmm. okay, that might have a really bad, uh, really, or really critical sort of, uh, like, you know, uh, background history, right? Medical history, basically. So I mean, I was thinking that, as you said, they gonna, you're also gonna, going to be inc- including x-rays in the next few weeks, I think, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But what about also including uh, the other medical uh, medical history in the background, so that at least they have an idea of the second what to look for and what... Great question. I haven't shown you this, but I should have done when I did the chatbot. You can take a full medical history so that every patient has got a medical history of like the things which are associated with uh, that disease, some of the time, not all of the time. And then also there are disease, like if you are somebody who's, I don't know, like say you come in with a urine infection, but actually like the guy is like 70, he, he's much more likely to have had like a stroke or a heart attack or something like that. So that's reflected in the sorts of patients that you get. So you can take a full history. And then if somebody's got like diabetes, for example, that will be reflected in their bloods. Oh, even if they haven't come in with like a diabetic crisis. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Great question. Oh, lots of questions, yeah. Hi, just a quick, uh, just a few things. So right now it's a type interface, isn't it? So yeah. are you going to think about making it more like verbal, like have a microphone so you can chat, so almost make it like a virtual patient? And uh, and also what level student would you have this aimed at? Is it anyone from, is it clinical, post-clinical? And would you have further aims such as like FY1 or any yeah. other group at all? So uh, I'll start with the second question, which is, uh, who is it aimed for? Mm-hmm. So it's it's aimed at clinical medical students from, say, third year all the way up to, like, pre-reg year. So it's like ST2 or CT2, depending. I know they keep changing the training pipeline. So um, we have tested it a lot in Germany. So I'm going to speak mostly to that experience. What we really concentrate on in uh, Germany is the way you get a score per patient. So how well you've managed a patient, you get like a percentage score. But um, one thing that you can do is uh, you get points for like getting a correct diagnosis, doing the right management and not doing something terrible, like giving adrenaline IV or something like that. Um, and so you just change the scores. So when we have uh, more junior medical students, it's much more important they get the diagnosis right. But when you're getting much further along in your clinical training, the diagnosis is important, yes, but you want to make sure you get the management on point. And so that's how we're adjusting it in that way. The underlying cases don't necessarily change in the same way that sort of medicine, like patients don't get harder as you get further along. Uh, the second question was about using uh, microphones. Uh, that's not something that we are planning on doing at the moment, um, mostly because that involves a lot more costs. We're a t- still a tiny startup. Even though I'm going full time, uh, we're only a tiny startup, so it's kind of like a bit beyond us at the moment, but um, it's a great idea and something that we would like to do perhaps. Cool. One at the back. Sorry, I- I've grabbed it. It looks great. Uh, I was wondering if you monitor or the teachers monitor like gamification of the application and like how do you try to stop students from doing that? Because being a student in the past myself, I would have tried to find the easiest way to get to the solution and pass a, a grade, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a great question. So we don't actually, like, it's not part of your exam. So like pers- okay. pa- uh, students don't necessarily have the motivation of like, game yeah like trying to cheat because i mean and to be honest like it's you're doing it in your bedroom usually like yeah that you don't necessarily have to come into class to use this because it is a browser so um yeah like just don't turn up if you're not interested but we do get a lot of people who get very very serious about it and i can see it in the data they get really stressed um and so i think they are mostly sort of 80 percent of them are taking it pretty seriously uh, and we do have to do some sort of slight hand holding of like it's not real it's okay you're trying to um just because you've got 15 percent on this patient doesn't mean you actually kill someone <laughs> so <laughs> yeah exactly caroline we're passing we're passing this on but just a quick one before oh you've got it um how how much have you seen the increase in kind of productivity and training of using your product rather than in real life do you have any stats on that so we don't have any stats on it in terms of like 
comparison, but in Germany, like we've had you know, 2,000 unique users. It's in, been embedded in the curriculum for like, I think two and a half years and whole cohorts. Like, so when they do the, they do like six month uh, semesters in Germany and you might do like a cardiology block. And so they'll be doing this every single week. Um, and what it is more productive in, in this particular way because we give feedback to the teachers being like, all of your students basically did terrible on heart failure this week. And then they get more teaching on heart failure. So it's more structured. Because I think when we're teaching medical students, especially like cardiology is a good example. We want to make sure people don't miss the heart attack. But it's like very typical. People know, medical students generally know the symptoms of heart attacks. They're much less good at like atrial fibrillation, like a funny heartbeat or... Uh, you know, something else uh, which is a bit more kind of like quote unquote less typical. And so it just allows us to direct resources towards those sorts of diseases. Obviously, the teacher has to engage with it. That's interesting. It's much more like the tech world, like iterating really quickly and helping them, them yeah, develop. Yeah. We had a question at the back. Well, hi. Um, just on the technical front, I just wondered what the reason was um, behind your decision to use Rust as opposed to switch to Rust as opposed to C sharp or Go or some other compiled language. Yeah. It's not. The, the most obvious choice because I guess you've got a lot more people who've got C sharp skills, for example, if you're hiring contractors and stuff. So just wondered what the reason was. Yeah, that, that choice. So it was a it was a personal preference. I'm going to point to Max now. Max loves Rust. Uh, <laughs> and to be honest, if I hadn't if, like if we hadn't been doing this business together, I'm not sure. I, it's like one of those things you always want to go and learn something. Um, but like, yeah. Do you, want to, do you want to say about Rust? Do you want to ask Rust? Okay. Rust is awesome, basically. I mean, it's, um, it's memory safe, but it doesn't have garbage collection. So uh, it's as fast as, let's say, languages like C, but you get the safety. And you also have to handle every single outcome. Uh, it can pass to WASM really efficiently. Um, it's, you can embed it into multiple databases, into Nginx. It's been voted the most favorited language six years in a row. Um, and uh, it's so secure that now a lot of hackers are using Rust to do their um, ransomware because it's so hard to break. We obviously didn't want to do ransomware, but, um, <laughs> you know, it was, a, it was a good advertiser. So I'm a bit of a fanatic, but I think Rust is hands down the best language. So, sorry, what was the question again? The question was for web development, do oh, you find it okay? So uh, do you want to tell everyone what your first book was called? Uh, Rust and Web Development. So, <laughs> that was, yeah, so I, I, I think the Rust and Web Programming is very good. Um, and obviously we're recording, so to my publishers it is a very good language. For us. <laughs> Amazon? Available on Amazon. <laughs> Um, we're going to bring it back to just a couple more questions. Yeah, at the back. So um, can I one just say the best microphone I have ever held? It's so cool. Um, so I have what's called ADHD. Um, and we get prescribed after the first meeting with a doctor, Listex Amphetamine, which was used in World War II to you know, help the soldiers become super soldiers and fight for two weeks on end. Not the best drug for a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so my question to you, and you kind of touched on it, it's for medical students to learn from stuff. Does that extend to prescription? And how do people respond to certain prescriptions and how can we better prescribe? Because if you look at America, for example, they actually get commission on prescribed medications. Um, obviously, Germany is very different, but just the prescription side of medicine, I'd love to learn more from you. Yes, yeah, so um, we, you can prescribe any drug that would be available in A&E. Uh, to to the virtual patients um, now things that are like typically started in specialist clinics like ADHD medicines wouldn't be available but you can I mean we've got so many drugs like literally like 300 drugs I think so you got you got a lot to choose from um, and the ones where it would affect your um, you know your observations like make your pulse say like I don't know adrenaline is the one I always go to because it's like very easy to understand if you give adrenaline your heart rate goes up your blood pressure goes up and so if you give that to virtual patients you see that in the observation charts um, and there are sort of other things one thing that we are bringing in hopefully in the next few months is going to be 
I give you fluid and uh, like a bag of fluid and it affects, you know, some of your blood tests. So that's kind of the next uh, the next kind of approach. But you can imagine with like 300 drugs, it's, it takes a while. So, Thank you. Any final? Oh, yeah, we've got three down here. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm being greedy. I'm asking a second question. That's great. Like great a, go for it. It's going to be a tough one. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Um, obviously, with uh, LLMs or, or ChatGPT, that sort of thing, hallucinations is going to be a big issue. How do you plan to tackle that? Because usually they fail for that reason. Yeah. So um, at the moment, because we've, as, as I said, we're using sentence embeddings, which is a relatively good solution for most things because there's a very structured way that you, medical students get taught to take a history like you know you take presenting complaint history presenting complaint etc uh so you can kind of predict the questions that people will ask but the thing with chatbots is it has like no memory of like what you've previously asked so that's one of the big things that i'm wanting to tackle in the next few months so if you say like do you have chest pain and i say oh yeah i've got lots of chest pain and then you say yeah how bad is it it will be like what do you mean like what are you referring to so that is one of the sort of everything in tech is like a trade-off so the sentence embeddings works kind of quick and day solution but uh, it does have this problem with like it's not 100 percent natural because people do typically ask like questions which sort of compound lmms is something that we're hoping to uh, bring in in the next sort of six months obviously we didn't imagine that chat gpt was going to come out um while we were like developing this product we do not have a plan necessarily for hallucinations, but watch the space. Um, it's not going to be ChatGPT, so I mean it's just too expensive. Uh, so it might well be some sort of um, uh, like sentence embeddings and LMMs, and like take the best one or something like that. Uh, is there any plans to integrate your system to other systems integrations? Yes. Uh, we would love to integrate it into clinical trials. So recruitment for clinical trials is a really big problem because it takes ages. You know, you need to find the 100 people who've got this particular condition and they have this particular demographic. Um, and like training people to identify those patients from like a general clinic is really challenging and onboard them. So uh, we would really like to sort of move this away from the A&E or sort of have another product which aims to reduce that uh, basically training of clinical trial uh, recruitment specialists. Um, but we don't have the contacts at the moment, so um, please come talk to me if you do. <laughs> Hi, I just had a question. Um, simulation training also focuses on human factors and team working. So I just wanted to know, is there any scope um, currently or in the future to integrate like between student communication when managing patients virtually? Yes, yeah, so um, there are, we, it's something we thought about a lot. Um, and because again, we're kind of a, we're a tiny startup, we have taken the approach that we're not gonna add features until we've got like a good solid base of customers. But the way that we've built it in Rust is that we can actually switch the, the turn-based element to it to more like a real-time event thing at some point if we sort of had the funding to do that. And that would open itself up to multiple people using the same like A&E. Obviously, you'd have to have more than three patients. Start with 30 patients and see how you get on. Uh, so that's something that we'd like to do. And then you could have different healthcare professions. So like maybe make it so like nurses can't prescribe drugs or they can't examine or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. That would be amazing. We'd love to yeah. do that. Oh. Yep, one final question just down here. Right. If, uh, what about, I mean, what about in terms of those you're saying for uh, clinical, clinical trials, right? Mm -hmm. But what about any, any sort of new sort of conditions or even diseases coming up, like novel diseases, I mean, coming up? I mean, what about in regards to that, I think? Do you think that would be quite a good uh, sort of a teaching method or a teaching aid yeah. at the same time? So we can add diseases in relatively quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, like COVID, we could add in, for example, etc. cetera. Um, one kind of a side point I'm going to just use, use it is we do have this idea, which is lots of things are um, 
you know, like someone turns up with back pain, it's not always clear, no. like what you should do with them. Like some people will go an MM, MMR, oh, sorry, uh, give an MRI. Some people will just like send you home, whatever. So uh, one idea that we had uh, early stage is to try and get kind of experts in the field and find out like, what do you do? If you've got all of these patients, you get 100 patients all present similarly, what percentage of you actually give do an MRI uh, and which don't? So, yeah, we see lots of things, and we, yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting... I'm sure you did. Thank you very much. Yeah. Caroline, I have one final question before we then break for pizza, um, which is how, how long does it take to add in data, like, and how do you create that dummy data? Uh, so it doesn't take very long to add in new uh, cases. Um, so probably we could add a new disease within, like, the bare bones of a disease, especially if it's one that's kind of, like a cardiology disease we've come and used some stuff to template like i don't know hour hour and a half something like that but the thing which takes a long time is the testing so once you've then made the new disease and you might want to have like a severe version and a mild version you want to like test it with people and that takes a while um and our two medical students at the back have really felt some of the pain are involved of that um because it's all about fine-tuning the signal and People don't always ask questions in the way that you think. Even though we're all trained in the same way, people don't always ask questions the same way. Caroline, thank you so much. Can we get one final round of applause, please, for Caroline? Really amazing. 